And today is part of a, our naturalist series. When we look at the many aspects and wonders of nature and how we need to be stewards and take care of things. And there's so many wonderful things to, to learn in, about nature in our journey and how we're all connected in so many ways. So Caitlin Cross, who is a mammalogist at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, and I found her as a, a, somebody working with Mississippi bats, Mississippi Bat Working Group. She's going to tell us about Mississippi bats, and I was interested to, that, to know that, to learn that she works up here in Union County in our caves, in our bats. So um, please welcome Caitlin uh, from the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science to tell us all about our bats and how we need to catch them. Hey y'all, I am actually going to be Mississippi Opal, his name is on there. He helped out with fossils up here. Uh, so he saw the Facebook post and he was like, hey, when are you doing a talk there? And I was like, tomorrow? How do you know about this? And, you know, we work in the same research department, but since he works with things that have long since been dead, we kind of don't work together too much. Um, but I'm a curator just like George is, and we actually share a lab, and I research all are non-game mammals. I mostly work with bats, and you'll see why. So first thing I want to start off with is true and false. I want to see what your basic bat knowledge is. Are bats blind? No. No. False. <laughs> all bats carry rabies. No. About 1% of bats carry rabies. <clears throat> it's a very low percentage. However, if you encounter a bat on the ground, there's a higher percentage of that bat being sick. So we never handle bats barehanded. It's always best to maybe wear oven mitts <laughs> or contact your local professional. Um, bats are flying mice. No. Bats are actually more closely related to primates, so us, than they are to rodents. Uh, bats will get caught in your hair. False. This because uh, you might be outside at night underneath a street lamp, and there might be bats flying above you because there's lots of insects, lots of moths caught uh, going to that light. So they might be swooping down towards your head, but they're not actually swooping towards you. They're swooping towards the bug that's right above your head. Um, so this is a common misconception. Uh, bats are the only mammal capable of true flight. Yes, true. That one's true. So even though we have creatures here called flying squirrels, uh, they cannot actually fly, they glide. They cannot generate true lift. Um, so bats are the second most species mammal in the world, just after rodents. There's about over 2,000 rodent species known in the world. Bats, there's 1,462, I think is the current count. Um, they occur everywhere in the world, except for extreme deserts and polar regions. And there are still new bat species being discovered, um, especially in continents of Africa. Um, there's a recent one about two, three years ago that made big news. So it's not as common as, say, like an insect, but there's still bats unknown to science. So um, they vary in size. Uh, the bumblebee bat, or the kitty hognose bat, is arguably the smallest, weighing two grams. That is a tiny, teeny, tiny little bat. Um, and occurs in a very local area. And then one of the biggest bats, there are several that get as big, um, but it's the flying foxes, about 1.4 kilograms. So that's a pretty big bat. And there's two groups of bats. Um, all bats are in the order Chiroptera, which means hand wing. I'll show you the anatomy of why it's called that. Um, and you have your big, your mega bats, and your micro bats. And they are very different. Um, so you see a lot of mega bats. Maybe you've seen Facebook reels of a bat eating banana or pinky, you know, the big famous Australian bats. Um, so those are all mega bats. They have big eyes, so they don't need to echolocate because they're looking for fruit. You know, fruit's not going to go flying around at night, so they don't need to echolocate and they don't have tails. Um, our microbats do, and most of our microbats that we have here do echolocate. So you can see the anatomy. Um, literally hand wings. So what 
makes our, our phalanges, that's the bat wing, and they use their thumbs to uh, climb. And their wing membrane actually attaches all the way down to the tail, and then the tail has a uh, membrane as well. So bats, when they're flying around the night catching bugs, they can catch it in the mouth, or they can actually catch it in that tail membrane, like a catcher's mitt, and bring it up to their face. So their anatomy is pretty cool. Um, their hips are rotated, and then their uh, knees are rotated 90 degrees, and then their ankles another 90. So they're actually backwards than how ours are. So they can bring their feet up to their face. Um, so very flexible, very agile, and they need to be uh, to fly around at night. Bats around the world eat a variety of diets. Some eat frogs, some like nectar, some eat fish, fruit. There are the vampire bats that drink blood. Uh, there's three species that we know of. We don't have them here. I know, I get a comment. I was like, oh, I saw a vampire bat in my yard. No, you didn't. <laughs> or I saw a fruit bat in your, my yard. No, you didn't, unless one escaped from the zoo. Uh, uh, there's pallet bats out to Texas in the desert area that eat scorpions. Um, I think that's pretty cool. They actually are resistant to scorpion venom. Um, so all Mississippi bats are insectivorous. All our bats eat insects. That's all they eat. Um, so smaller body bats are gonna eat the smaller insects like mosquitoes and flies. Bigger body bats are gonna go after those big moths and beetles. Um, they live everywhere. Um, it could literally be just a clump of dead leaves hanging on a tree. Uh, it's whatever they can find refugia. Spanish moss, there's some that particularly love Spanish moss. So it's gorgeous for us to look at. Bats actually love it. I've never seen one in there, but we probably walked right past them and never known. Uh, tree hollows, uh, so any tree that's uh, died on the inside, bats absolutely love that, especially our big bottom line hardwoods and shaggy bark, they'll actually, um, some species will even go underneath the bark. So our bats are really small. All they need is just a little bit of space to wiggle in there to find refugia. Uh, they will use bridges, and we're pretty unique here in Mississippi. I've talked to other states, and they don't have this structure. Um, this is called a debris deflector. So instead of just having a straight column underneath your bridge, some of our bridges on our more, our larger creeks have a triangular shape that has an internal cavity, and it's just like a tree hollow. Uh, so our bottom line hardwoods might be disappearing, but the bats that love those trees have found a man-made structure to use as well. And so this is actually helping protect our bats, to keep our bats um, around when they're losing habitat. So they're fun to go into. Sometimes the sediment underneath them is very loose and takes a little agility to maneuver through, but it's pretty unique here. I've, I've literally I've talked to almost all the biologists in the Southeast and they've never seen a structure like this. Um, we do have caves in Mississippi. In fact, one that I go to is right up the road, uh, but that one's down in Wayne County that's in the far left. And then culverts, another man-made structure underneath all our uh, major roads are wonderful bat for bats. In the southeast and uh, southern states, where we have a more mild winter, we've seen bats use these culverts. So if you go further north, they're not using them so much, but down here, it's impressive. Um, my two largest hibernaculas that are winter roost sites that have the highest number of bats. One is a cave, and the second one is a culvert. And it's pretty impressive that we can have a man-made structure that can hold as much as a cave. And then, of course, houses, abandoned houses. Um, this was a structure that existed outside of one of our WMAs, but unfortunately, that tree next to it has since crashed onto it, but that is just one example of where I go to find bats. Um, life history of bats. Um, so, Right now, we're kind of at the cusp of winter. It's still a little chilly, so many are still staying in their winter roost, but some have probably started moving to their maternal roost. Uh, the females, all the bats here, all the females will form a maternity colony or <coughs> hang out by themselves. Uh, the men go off and form a little bachelor colony. They're, they're not a part of raising the young, at least for our bats here. And so the females 
will have at least one pop, so a bat baby is called a pop, um, but there are species like the eastern red bat that in the middle photo, those are eastern red pops. They can have four to five. I think five is the most I've seen. Uh, others have reported six. Now think about it, bats are flying around with their babies. That's a lot of little ones to fly around with. Um, so in that instant with that middle one, mom was exhausted and she needed a little break. So she was found on the ground. And so I came and I became a surrogate mother and a little foster mom for those little babies while she recovered. Uh, she just, she was a little exhausted. So we get a lot of calls in the summer um, and moms just need a little bit of help for a little bit. Uh, but the far left, I know it's kind of hard to see, but you can probably see the bats flying around. Now it's a cave and there's tiny little dots. That's over 2,000 bats and they are jam packed into there. And so they'll have their babies among all these other mothers. So how does a bat know what's its, bat, what's its baby when it flies off at night and it might leave the baby behind? So some bats have developed a certain chirp that they can recognize, and other smell. They actually have a pretty decent smell. So when you're in a colony of 2,000 and you're in a deep cave, you gotta find your baby again. Um, so we're getting into maternity season. So this will be uh, my life for a while is baby bats. Um, I'll get a lot of calls, people finding out that they have bats in their house because you usually don't know. You really don't. They can be in your attic. You can live with your bats in your attic for years and never know. But usually it's a baby that maybe had fallen down on the ground, uh, got knocked out, um, and that's how people find out. Uh, so we'll go into maternity season for the summer, and then towards the end of September and really October, uh, bats will start moving out, especially in the northern regions on the coast. They stay in the same area year round, but up here they have to go find somewhere for a refugio for the winter. So mom will actually escort the babies around uh, that are now flying. Be like, hey, this area is good to stay in the winter. This area is good. You don't have to stay with me. You can go find your own spot. Um, and then we get our winter numbers. So this is tricolor bat. They're actually in torpor. Uh, torpor is a short period of hibernation. So they're not entering into hibernation as soon as they get cold and don't wake up till spring. Instead, what they're doing is when we have periods of cold spells, they'll reduce their temperature to conserve that energy, but when it warms up, they'll wake up again and go eat. Um, so they can't keep a lot of fat and water reserves on their tiny little bodies. They need to uh, replenish it. So we're pretty beneficial down here with those warm spells. Um, even hot, sometimes it's still like 80, 90 degrees, and those bats still have plenty of food to forage. Um, so that's a list of our bat species. I have that list printed off over there if you want to have a copy. We have 14 species of bats in Mississippi. That's pretty diverse. We've said in the past we've had 15, so you might still see that, including the little brown bat. But all our bats are little and brown, so people always think they have a little brown bat. Turns out they don't. <laughs> Um, so that is my part of my process is figuring out uh, who, you know, who actually knows what they're talking about when they say they have a certain bat. Um, but I want to also point out the conservation status, which is the middle one. We have three endangered bats. One's currently proposed. Uh, several are what we call species of greatest conservation need. So that is species that have been distinguished as something that we need to conserve. Uh, and we need to monitor before it ever ends up even being a candidate for the endangered list. So it's something we've noticed decline or potential decline or threat to um, before uh, they get to drastic number, low numbers. So these species are the myotids. The little brown bat is the same as one of these. As you can see, they all look alike, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to distinguish between them or among them. So, and three of them have to be federally endangered. So you really have to know how to ID these. And this guy right here, its ears are a little bit longer than the rest. And it's foot attachment. So if you happen to, happen to have the bat in hand, you can tell the foot attachment's different. The one in the middle, its fur is uniformly gray. That's why it's called a gray bat. And it has a bigger foot. 
the one on the far left on the bottom, its toe hairs do not go past its toenails. That is literally how you ID that bat. The one on the top, that's a common bat. That's what we see. That one's toe hair does go past. Its foot attachment is slightly different. Its ears kind of looks like this one, but it's still a little different. So this one is, this is a very tricky uh, group of bats to ID. And this is where a lot of research and funding has been going into this to um, monitor the species. But good thing is, they all act differently. They don't tend to overlap um, too much. Like these will use the same culvert, um, those might use the same bridge, but if you work with them enough, you can tell the difference, but you have to work with them enough because they really are all tiny little brown gray bats. <laughs> these are our beautiful Lazarus bats, uh, tree bats. These um, have fur, I'm gonna go grab that. Um, and y'all can pass these around. I have specimens up here, you're welcome to look at. But these bats are fully furred. Uh, their tail is it's actually a very long tail. This one was kind of dried out. It's fully furred, and they have fur on their underneath their wings. These are not necessarily going into caves. Instead, what they're doing is they're roosting on trees, and their color is to mimic uh, pine cones and tree, leaf, uh, tree leaves. So they will literally um, hang upside down. They'll tuck their wings in and use that tail as a blanket. Uh, so it's very long and it can actually go up to their face. You don't want to pass that around. <laughs> so the red bat and the Seminole are very closely related, same body size. This one has a richer mahogany color, this one's a more vibrant orange. If you find a bat in your yard, on the ground, odds are it's one of these two. Uh, so that one was the one that, you know, mama had the four babies and she needed a break. That's the red bat. These are very big bats. This is the hoary bat. It has hoarfrost. We call this the George Clooney of the bat world when you don't touch a gray. <laughs> uh, they are the only bat that's from east coast to west coast to Canada, and we're the only bat to um, go to Hawaii, so it's the only bat native there. And in fact, that bat has been so cut off from the mainland for so long, it's actually its own species now, so the Hawaiian hoary bat. And then that is the northern yellow bat. It's big. Two, just like the, uh, like significantly bigger than that bat passing around. Um, they like our coastal areas. They love the Spanish moss and the palmettos and our coastline. And we have very few records of them. Our most recent record actually came down the road from my mother-in-law's house. Um, so I thought that was really cool because I spent summers looking for that bat, going to our islands to try to catch that bat. And one just pops up down the road from my mother-in-law's. <laughs> And this is the catch-all for the rest. So the silver-haired bat is closely related to those other tree bats. Um, and they have the hoar frost too, a little bit. And as they get older, they actually they lose that touch of gray. So they're not like us. They don't get grayer. They actually get less gray. Um, and they're only here in the winter. So the women, the females, will um, actually go farther south in the winter um, to conserve energy so when it's time for them to have babies they weren't uh, depleted from the winter so they're a big migrant bat these are tricolor bats these are tiny little bats these are the ones that i call the flying chicken nuggets because um, of their size and color of the mcdonald's chicken nuggets and i work a lot with them um, you can't be you can't be scared of this <laughs> you cannot so very very small um, they get down to four grams. That's a very tiny little bat. Um, <laughs> he's, he's no longer with us. Yeah, yeah he is good. Um, so this is one that is currently proposed to be endangered. Fish and Wildlife um, is working on, they got bombarded with a lot of federal listings at one time. So they're working on some cool uh, technology and to best streamline consulting. So once they get all that worked out, this one will actually be listed as federally endangered. We're just waiting on a date. Um, and I'll explain the threat of why this bat is listed as endangered. This is our bigger bat, our raffinous bigger bat. It's the only one with big ears. And I'll explain why that one's different. This is an evening bat. This is another one that's common to your house. Uh, an attic, it looks just like the big brown bat, but smaller. Um, 
and they're stinky. I don't know why, but they have a certain odor to them. A little musky bat. Um, and it's one that I can ID by smell before I even see them. But this is a big brown bat, very common, one of our largest bats. The hoary bat is even bigger than this, um, but still relatively small. Um, they use all the habitats. Anywhere you can find a bat, a big brown will use it. Um, and they got big old teeth for eating that, That's an adult? That is an adult. And then this guy is different than everybody else. So all of these other bats are in the Vesper Tilidani day family, which is the evening bats. And he's in the Molossidae, which is free tail. Um, if you've ever heard of Bracken Cave in San Antonio, Texas, anybody? And now we're Congress Avenue, the bats emerging on the bridge. Uh, so Texas has the largest bat colony in the entire world, and it's the free tail bats. Um, they go into Bracken Cave, and there's about 15 million of them. And when they emerge at night, you can actually see it on the Doppler radar. So it looks like a storm popped up, but it's just bats. And yeah, that's a lot of bats, right? Well, there's off in the middle of nowhere. Um, but Congress Avenue is right there in town. And there's actually people have been studying um, and found that the ones, Congress Avenue, that's in town, even though it's the same species, they will emerge later because there's so much light in the city. Um, but anyways, so free tail bat, free tail. Um, these guys can reach flights of 60 miles per hour. So think about that when you're driving down the road, and bat can fly as fast as you can drive. And where is this place yeah. where there are 15 million? San Antonio, it's Bracken Cave. And you can go see it. Well, I'm in San Antonio, but it didn't say that. <laughs> uh, it's currently owned by Gabet Conservation International, and they're only there during the summer months. So we have a subspecies of these bats that actually stay here in the winter, but those migrate. Um, so they're only there in the summer, and it takes three hours for them to fully emerge. And they actually form a <laughs> and so you're far away from the entrance, but they'll spiral and sometimes they'll get close to you, but they're not going to touch you. And so you actually have wind coming off of these tiny little bats. And those bats are, um, it's not uncommon for a leucistic or uh, an albino to pop up in their population. So when I went to go see one, I literally saw, a, it could have been albino, but we'll just say leucistic bat. I could see it flying around. Um, and the local wildlife know about this. This is easy pickings for them. So hawks will come in. There might be some raccoons or some skunks down there. So they know it's about to be feast time. So it's a very entertaining talk. It's, I've never encountered anything else like that. And I've been in two foot crawl space with thousands of bats before. Having them emerge in front of you is a truly extraordinary experience. And they know, you know, they are flying in formation. They know uh, not to run into each other. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. It's like a murmuration of birds, but bats. Unless you're creeped out by bats, then it's probably not a cool experience. Um, so recently, last year, we had this new publication called the North American State of the Bats Report. Um, something like this was had, had been done on uh, birds, on waterfowl, uh, and so we decided we really needed to evaluate all our bats, because we've had a lot that are getting listed, federally listed, and there's a lot of concerns. Let's actually address it and have research behind it uh, that shows. And this report showed that over half of our bat species in North America are at risk of severe population failing in the next 15 years. This is not the next 50 years, this is 15 yeah. years. Um, so of course Canada has the least amount of species because they got a cold, colder climate. So out of their 17 species, three are severely imperiled. So the darker the orange, the more severe the status. Blue is more secure. And then look at the US. They have very few blue compared to orange and then Mexico too. Um, so what, what are the big threats? So according to this report, 98% of all our species are at risk of losing habitat, which that is the number one driver of why any species is ever listed on the federal endangered list, is habitat loss. 
And it makes sense. Um, we have growing developments, farms are getting bigger, cities are getting bigger, so it makes sense. Um, and then the way we treat our forests, you know, there's not much prescribed burns um, as there used to be. Um, so that's one thing we need to evaluate and look into when we're trying to conserve our beds. Next thing, climate change, 82%. And it's because of these extreme temperatures. So when we had that big freeze several years ago that closed the wind farms in Texas, and everybody remembers that, everybody thinks things getting over, those bats, that free tail bats, they're not meant for cold. They do not go into torpor well, and they were using a lot of bridges and whatnot. And just a short snap of cold can kill them. And so having something prolonged like that, uh, rehabbers were going out there, and uh, biologists were going out there to these bridges, and they were trying to get the bats that were still alive, but since they had been exposed, there's nothing they could use. So that extreme uh, wiped out thousands of these bats, and they occur in large colonies. Um, luckily, the ones that use Bracken Cave are, were not in Texas in the winter because they migrate south. Um, but on the eastern edge of Texas, they have the same subspecies as the one we have here, so those were the ones that were affected. <coughs> And then we just had this big drop this past winter. I mean, it's right before winter, right before fall. And that's when bats were trying to build up their fat reserves to go into torpor. But when you have a drop, you're losing a lot of water. And bats love the bugs that have a life cycle of water, flying above water. So that was a lot less food for them. So I actually did notice a decline in our bats this winter. My numbers were slightly lower. Um, and I had several more I always have a few dead bats each year, and it's just usually because winter is rough. I had a little bit more this year. Um, so something to think about. And then energy production. Um, we need clean energy. I mean, look at climate change. We need clean energy, uh, but we need avenues to work with wind turbines. And we are working with them, and they're very responsive. And that was the call I was on yesterday, um, was talking about what we can do uh, to work with these facilities. Um, so, you know, when energy is supposed to, is projected to increase 500% by 2050. And, you know, it affects birds too, something to think about, but during those periods of migration, those tree bats, uh, the red bats, the horries, they're most susceptible to uh, wind turbines in the fall. Um, you know, they're migrating through, they're usually in a lot of mountainous areas, which happens to be the same areas where wind turbines are occurring. And you wouldn't think Mississippi is suitable to wind energy. I thought I would never have to learn anything about wind turbines, but then we have one being built in the Delta and we're getting several more coming along the Mississippi River. And then we're gonna have stuff offshore, so. And we're finding out that bats are flying offshore. Um, don't know where they're roosting, except people have reporting them on oil rigs and boats. They're following boats out off, off the coast. Um, so, you know, they kind of just want to use whatever they can, and it makes it a little challenging as somebody that wants to conserve them. Uh, at one point, do you, like, do I also go out on the boats? Do I follow them? What are they doing out there? Um, so luckily there's a lot of researchers investing um, their time and resources to figure out what they're doing. Uh, but those tree bats, the reds, the horries, the silver hair, those are projected to lose over half their population in the next 15 years. So the hoary bat, the beautiful George Clooney bat, right, that, you know, occurs east to west in Hawaii, um, they are going to be evaluated for the endangered species lab list in 2027. That means that somebody thought that their population is in such a drastic measure that they need federal protection. We don't want species on the list. That's a lot of headache for us to have to deal with. So we're doing everything we can to keep things off the list. But that is our current reality. Um, and then this is what I work with. Um, this is where I started out with as a technician. And then I moved up into my position as a mammologist. But it all started with white nose syndrome. Um, how many people have heard of wetness syndrome before? This is why I do this. Because this is a deadly fungus that has killed millions of bats and people don't know about it. You probably know about chronic wasting disease with deer, 
Yeah. You should also know about White House Syndrome. Um, it is caused by fungus, I'm going to say this once, Pseudogymnoastis destructans, PD for short. Everybody calls it PD, it's too many syllables. Um, this fungus we found originated somewhere in Europe and was first detected in the United, um, North America in 2006 in the X in New York. And we really had, this was a new to science fungus. And it just happened to be some cavers saw um, some dead bats on the ground. And actually the year before, I actually saw fungus on the bats, uh, but didn't know what it was, didn't know it was harmful or anything like that. And it has rapidly spread. Um, so the older, wider blues, those have been there for so long. Um, and now the current management focuses is out west. And this is Mississippi. That's where we are. So the cave up the road, that has tested positive. And I have seen the number decline. I have not seen the actual fungal growth. I only have one county, that's Montgomery County, where I've seen the bat with actual fungal growth. So if you ever took a skin swab of your, hand, uh, your arm or something like that, you're gonna have stuff growing on you that you might not have an actual active infection. So we've been testing uh, bats since 2014 and they're, um, Hibernaculas, and we found the fungus first in 2014. So it could have been a few years before that, but that's when we first found, found them. And um, I started really getting into, you know, we were really focusing on caves. At the time, we did a few culverts, but then I really started amping up our culverts, because that's really where I'm finding a lot of bats. And that's in 2022, um, that's where I found the first bat with whiteness in your was in the culvert. And that was actually the first time it's ever been detected um, as actual fungus. We knew that the fungus could grow in there, but the actual infection to, for it to get to those conditions where it could have an active infection, we didn't think colors were suitable. Um, so I was the first document of that in Georgia as well. And then this past winter, I had a few more with it. So that's a little tricolor bat with the fungus actually growing onto it. Um, Did you say that was here in Union County? I've seen the fungus here. I've not seen the active infection. Um, but the numbers have declined. So I literally went in there one time and there was eight um, when there was supposed to be over 40. And it's, that, that cave doesn't hold many to begin with. It's never how, but to go in and you need at least 25 bats to swab when there's only eight. So, um, but this is what the fungus does. I'm not gonna go through the whole graph, but basically, see this bat on the right? That is about the die from the fungus. So the fungus invades all the bare skin. So on the nose, it causes lesions on the wings, and eventually it gets to a point where that bat can fly. If that bat can fly and it can and it's warm enough outside and it can eat, it can survive. And this fungus is cold loving and loves dark climates. So it has not developed a way to survive UV light. So if the bat flies out during the day and just flies in sunshine, it can survive. It can kill the fungus off of it. Um, but that's not, that's not suitable everywhere. So the, bat, uh, the fungus will invade the bat on the skin and it's an irritant, um, it's itchy. It wakes them up. They're waking it out of torpor more frequently. So they're burning energy reserves and fat reserves uh, to the point that, yeah, this fungus will eventually um, make them starve to death. You're so, using a word that I'm not familiar with, torpor? Torpor is short periods of hibernation. Okay. Um, so it does not affect all our species. Um, we have about 47 to 52, depends on who you talk to, uh, bats in, you know, in the United States and Canada. And these are the species that has been detected on. The ones that are, are in yellow are the ones that we have here. Um, but in Mississippi, I've only detected white nose on a tricolor bat, but I've also detected the fungus on big browns. And so it may never ever be as drastic down here as it is in northern climates where literally sites that had thousands of bats have none anymore. But um, <coughs> I don't want to completely depress you. Um, so this fungus is not lethal to humans at all, but we can spread it. You go into a cave, you bump it against the walls, you can get it on your clothes. So we have a strict decontamination protocol. It can be spread from us moving around. It can be spread to environment to the bat or bats to bats as they um, move around. 
But there's ways to basically knock this fungus back. There's no cure, but we can get it where the bat can be exposed to the fungus, but not die from it, and eventually develop uh, immunity to it. And we have seen that, especially in the Northeast where it's been around the longest. Little brown bats have started recovering because of they had a little bit of an exposure to it, but not enough to kill them off. And then they reproduced. And um, so there is some bounce back. Unfortunately, um, there's the Northern Liner bat. Um, that's the one that I'm holding in the photo for the advertisement. That one has not. Um, that one's seen a 99% decline because of this. So how do I survey for bats? Um, I go into the roost. That's one thing. I go into the caves, go into the culverts. I have text. Um, I make Jack smile for all the photos. He gets tired of me. Um, acoustics. So bats echolocate. That's how they see the world at night. The coolest thing is you can actually ID the species off of their echolocation. Um, so bigger body bats like the big brown are going to have the lower frequencies. But the smaller bats, like the tricolor bats and the southeastern myotids and all those myotids that all look alike, they're going to have the higher frequencies. The bigger body bats, um, if your ears are still good and you didn't listen to your music really loud like your mom told you not to do, um, you can hear those bigger body bats, like the hoary bat, um, as they fly above you. And these bats are actually very loud at night. If we could hear them, if we could hear all these bats, they're actually outside screaming. Um, because they needed to bounce off uh, to hear that echo. But over the years, um, moths have developed a way to combat that. Um, they hear the bat echolocating, and they can actually dampen the call so they don't actually receive the echo. So the bats have no idea that the moth is there. You know, they fly in stealth. <laughs> the raffinus bigger bat has developed a way, because they just almost all eats moths. If the moths are outsmarting it, it doesn't eat. So what the raft does, it has acquired a call. Everybody is out screaming, but this one goes flies and finds a little area where there's no bats, and it has acquired a call, because the quieter you are, the less of an echo you get returned, right? Well, that's why they have big ears. Uh, so they have a quiet call, moth can't detect them, they need those big ears to pick up the quiet echo. Um, so pretty cool correlation between those two. Um, and how do we, survey for them, it's just you put a microphone out. But you need a microphone that actually detects those high frequencies. And if, this is really nerdy, but this was just a circuit board. Somebody developed and I had a um, kickstart program and this is just a circuit board. And this is $100. The rest are over $1,000. So this is pretty cool that this can be effective enough as those if you deploy it right. Um, but yeah, technology is drastically changing. There is ones that you can even plug into your phone that has auto ID so software to it. Um, during the shutdown, I had fun with that. I was just walking around my neighborhood. I found several colonies of retail bats and apartments that they had no idea about. <laughs> they kept staying ignorant of it. Um, but this is what a bat call looks like. So this is the silicon. This is to show you how loud this bat was actually far away from the uh, microphone. So it's very quiet. It looks like it's very quiet. And this is what their calls look like. Um, so the same bat call, this is just a different way to record it. To <coughs> um, and this one, this, this one takes up a lot of data, so a lot of people don't record in it. Um, but you can see the bat actually has harmonics. So if you know anything about music, that's an octave above. Yeah, the bat can make those sounds. But this is zero crossing. Um, you can tell it's like this is the bat flying around, and then these little dots, this cluster of dots, that's it eating. So we can actually tell how much it's eating in the night. Without saying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you get more information. Um, this goes into physics and sound, and I'm not going to go all into that, I promise. But when you have more flat calls like this, that's calls going out. That's um, I'm in an open area, and I just doing a basic scan. This is closer. This is me fine-tuning. So the higher, or the higher, the more of a range, the more information you're getting back. So if you're doing lower calls like this, and this is a, technically a lower frequency, you're only gonna detect bigger things. You need the higher frequency to detect the little things. 
So like I said, the big body bats are going for the bigger things. They can do the lower frequencies. Those tiny little bats, they're going for the smaller prey. They need the higher frequency. So it all feeds into body size, to call, to what they eat. It all feeds into each other. Um, and I don't even need to know what species this is. I can tell you what it is. But I can tell you that this, I had put this microphone in an open area because most of the calls like this, and this is a bigger body bat, and this is bat probably eating big moss and beetles. But I could also tell you species, and it's like, this is probably big brown bat. Um, I'm not an expert in acoustics. I play around in acoustics, uh, but there are some people that, that that's all they do, and um, I need to do other things too. This is misstunning. This is how we track bats. So acoustics are great because you can put an acoustic recorder out in the landscape and you can detect any bat that's flying above your microphone. Uh, Misnet, it helps you target. Um, you need bats that are flying lower. So you need to put them in corridors um, to capture them. And birders found this first. They were like, hey, let's put some nets up and we can catch birds. And people were like, I think that would also work for bats if we did it at night. Um, so this is what I do. This is what I do during the warm months. I'm out in the middle of nowhere, no cell servers, on a creek or a trail somewhere out there catching bats. So when you're cozy inside and not getting eaten alive by mosquitoes, I'm out there. That's what I'm doing. Um, um, you gotta love it. Um, I'm a morning person, but during the summer I turn nocturnal. I don't get into my bed until 2 a.m. But that's what I do. Um, so this is what you do when you catch bats. Uh, we do basic health checks, um, we record body weight, we record their forearm length as a unit of metric uh, body condition. We're looking if they have any ectoparasites, or these two bats right here, they have alopecia. Um, and this is something we've noticed during maternity season, those poor mamas are stressed out, uh, they lose hair. And then we're also looking at their wings because uh, they can have little pinhole pricks. But if you're doing this early in the summer, um, you can actually s see if this bat had come from an area that had been exposed and it had been exposed to whiteness because you can see that scarring. Um, and then you can do reproductive health. Uh, so that's when we know like when are our bats having babies and when are the babies bullent. During July, that's when all the babies Bullet is means be able to fly. That's when they start really flying around and they're not good at evading nets. Uh, so we catch a lot of babies. So my capture rates in the beginning of summer might get zero to five towards the end of summer, 15. So I get a little bit more busy um, when those babies start being able to fly. But it's all catch and release. Um, and if you would like to miss net, you think this is cool. You want to spend some time with us and see bats up close. You can join the bat working group. Anybody can form bat work, uh, become a bat working group member. Um, it's we're based off the Southeastern Bat Diversity Network, um, and we have a meeting coming up at Mississippi State next week. Uh, you don't have to attend that, uh, but our MISNET event will be discussing when we're going to do it. We're probably going to shoot uh, near Natchez area, so that'll be really cool. A lot of great places down in Natchez. And we also have an annual clover blitz. It's usually the first or second weekend of January. I organize that. And then we have a bridge blitz that our current uh, co-chair organizes. And then you can get it on our email listserv if you want to stay in touch. Or I manage our Facebook pages. Um, and that's the QR code is for all that um, if you want to be active in this group. Or hopefully I didn't scare you away from bets. Um, <laughs> I'll take some questions right now, and then I'll go into bat houses if you have any questions. I have a question about uh, like your burning. You said people didn't do that as much, and how does that affect the bats? Uh, fire suppression, uh, and it can do, when you have a cluttered area, down there you back to fly in cluttered areas. Um, there's many that actively avoid it. And then also it can affect the insect community. There is a lot of research into this, a lot of grad, uh, project showing um, the detrimental effects of um, not actually how to, not doing fire. Mm -hmm. It's really good for you to do the fire, and it's really important to do it during heat times. If you're doing it in the winter when it's a really cold night, 
um, bats can actually go into the leaf litter um, and it takes them a long time to wake up. But that's not usually when people are burning around here too. Um, so it's not something you need to worry about and we actually have some really cool videos of people doing prescribed burns and you can actually see bats flying off. So they're safe, um, but now their habitat is getting um, more suitable for them. Any more questions? Or? The, um, the, the picture you had of the bridge where you had done the special apparatus under the bridge, where was that taken? That, that one, I think, was Seminary, um, Potomac Creek. Is that, is that Mississippi? Oh, yeah. All those that are Mississippi. Was, just Mississippi. Mississippi specific. And what did you call that? That was a debris deflector. A bridge. <coughs> debris deflector. Debris deflector. So literally. Well, that was a seminary. <laughs> Mississippi. So if you ever do the um, kayaking on Okotoma, where they drop you off is right there. And so people do know that there's bats there. And I tell them, hey, please stay out of it. Because uh, you can hear them. During are there the many of those being made under the bridges? Uh. Mm -hmm. I want to say I have around about 20 sites, and it's all 20. major. It's all what? It's all major creeks. Um, so, but I, again, I'm, I've talked to other states. I don't know why Mississippi is different. Yeah, because you know, so my daughter does the same thing in Montana that you do. Yeah. And I, she's never talked about the bridge deflectors like that. Yeah, I think it's pretty I've never easy. seen that before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, bat houses. This one's a small one. Bat houses are meant to be huge. Uh, so ones that you get at local stores may not be best suited. Um, but this one's small because I have to carry it around. This is made out of cedar. Cedar, as we all know, is a natural bug repellent. It's really good. Uh, you don't want to ever use treated wood because the oils come off of that. Bats are climbing in here. They're grooming themselves. They're exposed to all the treated wood. So cedar's good. Um, Water-based paints, too. You don't have to paint them so dark down here in Mississippi when we get pretty hot, um, but that's when they're primarily using this is during maternity season. Um, they want to incubate those babies. I mean, if they're using our attics, which get pretty hot, you know, that house needs to be good. Um, I don't ever recommend mounting on a tree. And the reason why is because trees are shaded and they need that solar exposure. And also if you're on a tree, um, you can't keep out gray rat snakes, raccoons, mm -hmm. squirrels. Squirrels love to take over this. They'll chew up the top and they'll plug up the bottom and take over. Or hawks will just perch right on the branch. Mm -hmm. So I always put mine on a pole and out away from everything, full sun. And it needs to be at least 10 to 12 feet off the ground. Um, and that's to keep them safe. But also our bats, they'll come out and they need to drop before they generate lift. Uh, so they need a drop. Um, you see these grooving? They need something to grab onto. So a lot of times when a, somebody puts up a bat house and it doesn't get used and they send me a photo, there's usually not a landing spot down here. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that they won't use it, it's just less likely to. Uh, so they need to grab onto something to get in. And inside's all grooved too. You need a ventilation spot. Um, this one's just a single chamber, so just one hell slot. But we actually recommend multiple chambers. So um, this would be built bigger, and then there'd be uh, slots on the side too. Um, bat Conservation International has the Bat Builder ha uh, Handbook. It's free to uh, download. I use the four chamber um, bat box plan. I put them up at Percy Quinn State Park and at our, uh, at the museum. Uh, fortunately, where I put out the museum is very shaded, but it's just to show people what a bat house is supposed to look like. So you don't go to your local lawn or garden and you buy one that's the same size as, say, a birdhouse. Yeah, they need to be big. Um, at least a foot this way and two feet this way, um, at least, or even bigger. Bigger the better, because the more larger it is, the more bats can fit in there, and our bats like to have a minimum of 50 individuals in the summer. Um, so you need, because of the maternity colony, they need to be all together and warm. Um, any more questions about bat houses? Does it matter about the plants you have in your garden relative to bats? If you want to have, you say garden for bats, um, you need to have plants that are host 
for the bugs that they eat or um, night blooming or ones that have blooms at night that say moths would use. So it just depends on the area which you have. You probably already have all what you need. Yeah. Um, and you can set a little insect trap to see, uh, but. Because bats are pollinators as well. Yeah, the ones that rest realize, are. People don't realize that bats are pollinators. Yeah, we just did Pollinator mm -hmm. Day at the museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. the ones specific, uh, actually at West, um, they're designed for that. They have a long, long nose and long tongue. Mm -hmm. But the palabat, the one I told you, they eat scorpions. Mm -hmm. It's not meant for it, but it still goes into those flowers. And actually, mm -hmm. I think it's a better pollinator because it gets covered in pollen. And it's it's a happy little bat afterwards. There's photos of it smiling. It's like, it's the best thing ever. And then it goes to the next flower, and it's covered in pollen. Though those pollinators only get a few spores. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. But people think of them only for eating insects, but you know, of course, no bees are pollinators, but yeah. Moths are pollinators. Bats are really, really great for pollinators. Wasps are mm -hmm. pollinators. Yeah, wow. Right. Yeah. And this is a bat skeleton if you want to see it too. You see those fingers, how they're elongated, and how the hips and knees and feet are rotated. I was going to ask you about the pups. So when they're, so they, I mean, if you don't have a bat box, but they're out in nature, so those pups that are in um, a little maternity ward type thing, the mothers aren't actually, don't actually carry them at all. Do they, are they hanging from there? Like when they go out, when the mothers go out to go catch insects and go get their dinner, what are the pups doing? Are they hanging? Yeah, they, they, they can hang. Um, usually they, she has really them in a, uh, in a little spot. Yeah, they, oh, their feet are good. Just yeah, like they, baby grips. Right from birth. Yeah, and okay. but they she does fly with them, and she if she's yeah. moving to a different area, they fly. And on those, her back, they fly on her back. And belly, they're all over. Okay. Um, and they have a special tooth, and it's gonna sound horrific. Um, a special tooth with an extra barb uh, to help oh, them hold oh, on to mom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she they're biting, um, but those feet they're pretty strong. Um, okay. Because I know they don't have a nest like a bird nest. No, they so don't. they're not putting the pups in a nest. Mm -hmm. They're hanging. So all those dead leaf clumps, uh, right. our Spanish moss, any mm -hmm. refugia uh, mm -hmm. in, on a tree underneath the bark, uh, that's where babies will stay while mom's foraging. But if okay. she's moving, they don't use, uh, a lot of these bats are moving among sites during the summer. So some will stay in that cave all summer, but like the raffinus figure bat with the big ears, mm -hmm. it's moving every two to three days to a different tree roost. Because if predators learn that it's in that tree, they're just gonna hang right. out. So it's for their safety to move around. Um, so they'll kind of hang on like a possum baby does. Yeah. yeah. Hang, hang anywhere they can. Yeah, and sometimes, unfortunately, you do find a path on the ground that probably did fall Dropped. off the mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? You probably learned way too much about that. <laughs> <laughs> I well, of course, we're going to put up a bathhouse here at the museum. That would be neat. We need to get it a good bit bigger. And there are websites that have rebuilt ones uh -huh. um, that they'll get to spec. Okay, we find our spot in our space. Mm -hmm. Or you get a local Boy Scout troop or somebody that's wanting yeah, an eagle. Yeah, yeah, that'd, that'd be good. That'd be a great idea. But my daughter, when I tell you, when she was doing the white nose syndrome yeah. testing, they did the they did the nets. Yeah. They used the net, and um, thankfully, they treated them. And I, you saw the pictures I showed you, but they did not find any that actually had the yeah. white nose syndrome. So Montana's good, yeah. <laughs> at least in her area. Yeah, and it's also like not every. Well, she's working with those little brown bats. Um, the little brown bats, yeah. And. I believe they also use tree roofs too, um, which if they're using more trees and stuff like that instead of caves, mm -hmm. that's better because the fungus can't really grow there. Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah. I was yeah. in the Mammoth Cave yeah. a few Mammoth years ago and they were making you put um, booties. booties on to keep from carrying in any. Yeah, she had the whole hazmat. Yeah, the Tyvek suits. You saw, her, you saw her pictures of the uh, yeah. you know, hazmat outfit, yeah. Mammoth Cave now just really does careful. soap and water afterwards. Mm -hmm. So the fungus has already been there, so they're not worried about you bringing in more fungus yeah. as their point of view, but they're just, and it's just soap and water. It's not, and that's the biologists and then everybody else that use, you know, National Park, they have this argument about it, but soap and water is not enough to kill the fungus. 
you need the bleach or Lysol or something to put into it. But if things are out in the sun too, that inoculates it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I went to Mount Kip a few years ago. It's yeah. amazing. You didn't talk about the blood suckers. You want? I don't work with them. The I talked about them a little bit in the beginning, and they don't suck blood. They just drink it. <laughs> blood drinkers. Why? I mean, they're not like Tina Shaw. <laughs> They're just you know making a little hole, and it's just a little bit of blood, too. And, and it's they, mostly cattle and poultry. I was gonna say they like cows, not yeah. humans. <laughs> and like if cows. you ever want to see them, they're at the Memphis no. Zoo. No. <laughs> <laughs> they prefer cattle. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. No thank you. We appreciate you coming and doing this. So this is a list of the species what their status is, where they are, and when do they occur in Mississippi. Um, if you want to get involved in more of the bat world, or maybe this was just enough for you. <laughs>